Raise your hand if you consider yourself a prophet. Nobody. Okay, that's kind of what I was expecting. Uh, in the Bible, we hear a lot about prophets. Today, we hear a passage from Jeremiah that comes from a part where Jeremiah is speaking on behalf of God, critical of false prophets. The prophets, uh, sometimes we think of them as sort of these future seers who knew what was going to happen. Today we hear Jesus say, uh, how do you not, are not able to interpret the times? That's really what prophets were. They would sort of survey the world around them and discern the word of the Lord that would more or less often say, uh, we're not doing what God has called us to do to live the way God has called us to live, and so we have some adjustments to make. Uh, prophets would also sometimes say, you know, things aren't great right now, but don't worry, God is going to make things better again. They kind of had that twofold role of lifting up the vision and where the people fell short and lifting up hope when things weren't going well. But in the passage from Jeremiah, there, it starts off by God saying, am I close by or am I far away? And as I read it, I'm not sure what the right answer is, but then God says, I fill everything. So I think it means both close by and far away. And then uh, it gets into this talk about false prophets. The false prophets are the ones who just talk dreams, and the real prophets are the ones who bring the word of the Lord. And I started to wonder about dreams and what does that mean to be a false prophet that just brings dreams. And the best I could come up with was to equate dreams with sort of wishful thinking. And uh, the more I think about what the prophets often called the people to do, it was to change. Right? We're not hitting the mark of where God calls us to be, so we should probably do something different. And sometimes change is hard, right? Often change is painful. And so it strikes me that the false prophets probably had one of two messages. One was, everything's fine. We don't need to do anything different, right? Even though the world is always changing around us, are we willing to adjust to those changes and accept the pain that may go with that? The second thing was, maybe not everything's fine, but we can change without it costing us anything. It doesn't have to be painful. I think about uh, a diet plan that requires no exercise or, or uh, dietary changes to lose weight, right? The change without the pain. Or uh, the commercials that say, for just $19.99, we'll send you this book that'll show you how you can make a million dollars without ever leaving your house. Some kind of change without the work that goes along with it, right? So Jeremiah is critical of the false prophets who are perhaps just bringing these messages of you don't have to change anything or you can change, but there doesn't have to be any pain that goes with it. And God is saying, no, the real prophets are the ones that speak this word from the Lord that I give them. Now that word often was critical of people, right? And the way that they were living according to how they thought God called them to live. And so I'm going to rephrase the question before I asked if you were a prophet. Now I ask, have you ever looked at someone else and their brokenness and thought, gosh, they're sure not living the way I think God would have them live? Probably, right? A few years ago, our uh, electric lawnmower broke. Uh, the way that mower uh, works is it's got this little orange handle thing that you pull up to the handle and that presses a switch that turns the blades. And I was about halfway through cutting the grass when it stopped spinning. And so uh, I took it apart and found that there was a little uh, plastic post that that handle hinged on. And that had broken off. And so I took a screw, put it through where the post was, and magically the mower started to work again. Well, it worked for a couple years. Last week it broke again. And I knew, I took it apart, the screw was still there, but it had lost enough of the plastic underneath that it's just not going to work. Well, it turns out when we bought our house, the people that owned it before left us an electric mower. And so now I have one that works and one that's broken. And I don't really need a broken lawnmower taking up space in my house. So we just left it out at the curb. But it also reminded me of a time when we were in seminary and we were, uh, had a wedding coming up and we had found a ceramic artist that made these beautiful crosses. And so we had bought the couple a uh, ceramic cross and my neighbor was over, and I was showing him the cross, and I dropped it, and it broke. Now, does a broken piece of uh, ceramics of any kind make for a good wedding gift? 
Not so much, right? I don't have a lot of use for a broken gift that I can't give away. Now, as people, we live in a culture where broken things, unless it's like an heirloom, like a grandfather clock that's beautiful and has been in the family for generations and doesn't work, but that's okay. Unless it's something like that, we don't have a lot of room for broken things. We live in a throwaway society where we don't expect furniture and appliances and electronics to last very long. And when they don't, we throw them out and get a new one. Well, it's one thing to have that attitude about stuff that's broken, but I wonder how often we have the same attitude about people that are broken, where they're able to be thrown away or kept at a distance. I think about uh, the guy I know who had a little bit too much to drink one night and rolled his car on the way home and decided to run off into the woods and hide until he sobered up. And that was just one incident, but it's easy to look at someone like that and say, well, we're all saints and sinners, and we're all broken, but I have not rolled my car and thought the best option was to run and hide in the woods. I think of several people I have worked with over the years who have been arrested. One was found in pornography. Another one had some other sexual misconduct. Another one uh, was drunk driving and had a car accident and passenger died. He actually just got out of jail recently. And you want to look and say, well, of course we're all broken. Some of us are just more broken than others. You think about uh, people that, uh, have you ever thought, like, um, especially with your kids, there's a group of people you don't want them hanging around with? And we say, well, yeah, of course our child's not perfect, but they're not that, and we don't want them to spend time with those people because they're particularly broken. So if we come back down to Jeremiah, who's saying, like, there's false prophets who speak wrongly in the name of the Lord, how often do we maybe think, yes, of course we're all sinful and broken. Just some of us happen to be a little more broken and sinful than others. As I read that passage this week, I thought, gosh, I bet Martin Luther has something to say about this. So I went and looked in the catechism at two things. One was the part of uh, the commandments that says, do not use the Lord's name in vain, which we often simply equate to, like, don't curse uh, God's name. But what Luther says is uh, that primarily we can misuse God's name in lots of ways by saying we're doing things in God's name. So if we are looking at other people and saying, well, they're more broken than we are because I understand from my faith that we shouldn't do X, Y, and Z, we're now using God's name to judge people in ways that maybe we don't judge ourselves. And in that same explanation in the large catechism, Luther says we are like experts at glossing over and hiding our own misdeeds. So even as we might say, well, of course we're all broken, our own brokenness, we go, yeah, but... There were reasons for that, and I, you know, I'm doing okay, but, but I didn't do that, right? So he's saying don't misuse God's name by judging other people and hiding our own misdeeds. But then there's also the part of uh, the Lord's Prayer where we say, hallowed be your name. And Luther says, of course God's name is already holy. We don't do anything to make it so. The request when we pray that is that it will be made holy among us. And how can God's name be holy among us, but for us to live godly lives and Christian lives, which is to say to focus on our own behavior and not everybody else's. And in a surprising little twist for me, Luther's suggestion amidst all of that is that we dedicate each day at the beginning and at the end to God, which is where we get the idea that every day we come to the waters of baptism and start new. So we've got maybe false prophets uh, who judge others in God's name wrongly or who tell us we don't need to change and that if we do change, it should be easy. But then we get to the end of that passage today. If God's name is going to be made holy among us and change us, what does that look like? Well, Jeremiah uh, speaks the word of the Lord and God says, uh, my word is fire and it's like a hammer that breaks apart the stone. And then Jesus, in the gospel passage today, says, I did not come to bring peace, but division. And he talks about all this kind of division and then says, I bring fire, right? 
Well, that starts to get uncomfortable when we hear Jesus talk that way and the prophets talk that way because we want God's word to be comfortable and we like to think of grace as this great gift of life that's comfortable. But I think what both of these passages suggest to us today is that sometimes grace is a hammer that has to break something. Now, there are people who use the Bible as a hammer to judge other people. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about God's grace coming and we maybe don't first experience it as freedom, but we first experience it as stress that is breaking something within us. I suspect that it is a gift of grace when an addict gets to a point where they can no longer justify and explain away their behavior, but they understand now that they are so broken that they need help and they find their way to a 12-step meeting, right? Something had to hammer away and break something. Wednesday night uh, in worship, we talked about How is it that some traditions uh, ordain women and others don't think you should? And how do we get to all these theological positions? And what we talked a lot about was the division in the church that comes when we're so sure we're right and that others are wrong, that we can start to live in our rightness as opposed to by God's word. Well, sometimes it may be a gift of grace that our certitude gets broken by God, right? that the things we hold so dearly get shattered and then there's room for something new. Sometimes the thing the hammers have to break away with us is our prejudices about others. This last week, uh, the ELCA had its, uh, every three years we have a big church-wide assembly from all of our 65 synods across the U.S. and they vote on things and have speakers and it's a big long church meeting. But this year, there were some very significant things that happened at this big, long church meeting, one of which was they decided to empower a task force to look at and consider rewriting our entire Constitution. This is no small task, and our Constitution was shaped when three denominations of Lutherans came together and had to negotiate how much power does the bishop have, and how much does the pastor have, and who gets to do what, and how do we handle congregations that are being squirrely, and how do we handle pastors that committed misconduct? All that's in a constitution. Well, why did they debate that? Several months ago, we had a Spanish-speaking congregation in California whose Spanish-speaking pastor was removed by their Senate council over allegations of misconduct that were never fully investigated, and none of our constitutional processes were followed. And eventually, he was removed from our roster of pastors And that congregation was not given any support in terms of new leadership as they were continuing on. And the day of the removal was a big feast day in Spanish-speaking churches. It would be like y'all showing up on Easter and somebody showing up and saying, yeah, we removed your pastor, right? Like, this was a huge deal. And in the months since, much of the conversation has been about how our systems, our constitution, our discipline processes, all of the things how often they are used to do injustice towards our pastors that are people of color and towards congregations who have maybe not English as their primary language. And so all of that leads to, hey, maybe we should look at our constitution, our processes, and rewrite that. Is that a comfortable thing for everyone? Not even close, right? It's like a hammer that's hammering away at the things that some of us hold dear and our prejudices so that something new can happen. All of this is to say, as Jeremiah talks about fire and prophets, and as Jesus talks about division, what I think they're really saying is that sometimes God's grace is like a hammer. Not that it breaks us, but that it breaks apart the things that get between us and God, and between us and us. When that cross broke in our living room and my neighbor was there, uh, we knew, knew we had to buy another one for the wedding. But my neighbor said, can I have that? And we said, why? And he said, well, I'm a recovering alcoholic. And for me, a broken cross that has to get glued back together is the perfect image of where I'm at as a human being, right? Broken, but made new. And you can talk about Jesus being broken on the cross and been given new life. And that that broken cross hanging on his wall is a symbol of all of that death and resurrection stuff that equips us to be God's people. So when Luther calls us to these waters of baptism to start new every day, 
Sometimes we might just experience them to be a little bit fiery and a little bit like a hammer. And if you remember, when Jesus gets baptized, John's, ahead of his baptism, John says, one is following me who will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. It's a cleansing fire that makes us new. It's a cleansing hammer that breaks things away. And all of that takes us to places where we can know God's love and carry that love out into the world. Yes, we may be judgmental sometimes. Yes, we may want to change without the pain or not change at all. But as all of that change happens around us anyway, God equips us to walk into it with grace, even if sometimes we experience that first as a hammer and then as God's love that frees us. Amen.